Hey Sardis, on this, the fourth Sunday of Epiphany, I am grateful for coffee cups. Tomorrow is February the 1st, which will mark the 60th anniversary of the sit-in movements started at the Woolworths lunch counter in Greensboro. Four young men uh, decided to sit down at a, at a lunch counter and demand their right to be served, demand their right to simply have a cup of coffee. In the 60 years since, many, many, many places in our country have worked to integrate their tables, though to be honest, many, many more uh, have yet to be integrated. I am grateful, Sardis, for all those souls before us who have worked to make the tables in their lives accessible to others. And I'm grateful for each of you in your efforts to do the same. Let me also say that this morning I am grateful for the way you all participate in this table of worship. Those of you who host, those of you who serve as guests, those of you who do all of the work to prepare for us to enjoy this meal of celebration and worship together. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all you do to help make Sardis, Sardis. Our lesson this morning comes from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. Hear now these good words. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for Jesus taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And the man cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked the man, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing the man and crying with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed and they kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning's homily is entitled, A New Demonstration of Authority. From its very beginning, Mark's gospel doesn't hesitate to let us know that Jesus is called and credentialed to bring about God's world. The prophets have foretold it. The evangelist has baptized Jesus. God has affirmed Jesus. The wilderness has even tempted and tested Jesus. Jesus is ready. Last week, Jesus told the earliest disciples, and you and me as well, that the work has begun. Jesus invited them, and you and me as well, to fish for people. Jesus reminded us that we too are credentialed, that we too are called to do God's work in the world. This week, the credentials and calling of Jesus are affirmed in the way Jesus demonstrates authority. I think it's helpful for us to consider briefly the meaning of the word authority. In most instances, I think we understand authority as a noun, a power that can be possessed or obtained. Merriam-Webster's dictionary most commonly uh, defines authority as the power or right to give orders, make decisions, 
and enforce obedience. Authority is the power or right to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience. Local leaders have a formalized power, a title or a badge or a platform to enforce the will of the ruler, the monarch, or the ultimate leader. Such a definition, I believe, describes the authority wielded by scribes in first century synagogues. These were elite and learned men of the priestly order, and there was always at least one of them in a village like Capernaum, one of them who were charged with interpreting and enforcing the community standards. I think it's fair to say that in the Roman era, many scribes were in a difficult position. They wanted to protect the institution of Judaism, but do so in a delicate enough manner as to not upset the local Roman authorities. I think it's also fair to say that their expression of authority, that is, their interpretation and application of law, might often advance Roman or personal interests rather than those of their faith communities. Merriam-Webster offers a lesser used, even tertiary definition of authority. In this instance, authority is the power to influence others, especially because of one's commanding manner or one's recognized knowledge about something. So that second definition as authority as a power to influence others because of one's commanding manner or because of one's recognized knowledge. I think that this is a better way to describe the authority of Jesus. When Jesus invites the disciples to fish for people, Jesus doesn't call the local wildlife administration for a fishing license, nor does Jesus procure the services, recommendations, and equipment of the local sporting goods store. When Jesus goes fishing, Jesus uses his intuition and his charisma and his authenticity to invite others into meaningful conversations and relationships. Likewise, when Jesus decides to visit the synagogue, he doesn't call ahead and ask the corresponding secretary for a formal invitation to speak or to be introduced into the order of worship. Nor does Jesus rely on formal documentation of his training or formal expression of his legitimacy. The oratory, the presence, and the oomph of Jesus exhibit his authorities. The scribes in every town and village may claim to have authority, but it's really the authorities, the capital A authorities, that have a hold on the scribes. But Jesus, Jesus, on the other hand, has authority. That's right, Jesus has authority. And what Mark's gospel lets us know today is that Jesus is going to use that authority in unique and authentic ways. The text's movements substantiate this claim. The townspeople are used to going into or toward the synagogue or square. It was most likely more akin to a town square in those days. And the townspeople are used to being received by scribes who would teach or interpret text in such a way as to enforce their personal authority. These scribes used Torah to fortify their systems, not to embolden and empower their people, nor to imagine God's possibilities. Theirs, that of the scribes, is a power that requires people to be drawn in and in many instances coerced to stay in line. The scribes don't have power because of their presence. They have power because of the force their presence might possibly exert. But Jesus, Jesus doesn't wait for people to come to him. Jesus fishes where the people are. Jesus enters the town square and he offers his teachings and his ideas. And the people respond to him and recognize his authority, not for fear of what might happen if they don't, but instead because in Jesus, 
the people notice one who channels real strength and real power. So it's clear in this text that Jesus has a real sense of authority. And once we know that Jesus has this authority, the question is, how will Jesus use such authority? Mark's gospel tells us very quickly. A man with an unclean spirit cries out among the congregation. Some force, some metaphorical demon present, prevents this person from claiming his wholeness. Now, I know a lot of people who have exegeted this text in the past will call this scene an exorcism. And I, I think that's fine, but I don't believe that such an expression, an exorcism, captures what's really happening in today's story. Maybe, as I read this story, this person has a severe mental illness that intrudes upon his ability to express his inner beauty. Maybe, maybe this person has a form of epilepsy and from time to time seizures wrest control of his senses. Or maybe, maybe this person is just simply overwhelmed by grief. Or maybe it's not any of these three things. Maybe this person is overwhelmed by a system that never affirms him for expressing his real gifts. Maybe the local leaders have spent so much time equating shame with love that nobody can ever have a clean spirit in this place because a clean and a whole community might jeopardize the entire operation. Maybe, in reading this story, it's not so much that an unclean spirit is being removed in the midst of the gathered community, but rather that the gathered community is falsely labeling unclean that which is beautiful and whole and clean and wonderful and valued, that which is a God-made spirit. I don't think that Jesus is healing in this story via extraction or exorcism. I think what Jesus is telling to get out of here is this person's dependence on an outdated credentialing process. The scribes and others in traditional roles of power used Torah to rigidly define God's hospitality and healing. God can only be hospitable and God can only be benevolent if the community operates within the bounds of a system where those in power can declare what is clean and what is whole and what is valued. And in such a system, power isn't shared and I dare, and I dare say God is absent. But what does Jesus do? How does Jesus respond? Well, in this story, Jesus empowers this person to feel whole and to feel connected and to feel valued. Jesus uses his authority in a way that makes God more accessible to the community and in a way that invites the recipients of such healing and such power sharing to go and do likewise. Jesus isn't using power to fuel a futile system. Jesus is using power to build the beloved community. And in the coming weeks, as his authority becomes more evident and more visible to those around him, Jesus will shun each and every attempt to make him cons consolidate or hoard such authority. I think this morning, in this particular story, Jesus shows us that divine authority is not born of monarchs, nor is it administered like a local magistrate. In this story, Mark's gospel tells us, and Jesus' actions reveal, that real authority is claimed and shared in the love of God and love of neighbor. And so, having read this text and having thought about it, I wonder, Sardis Baptist Church, 
If we were to recognize, really think about, truly get in touch with the authority of Jesus, what kind of lunch counters do you think we might be able to integrate? What, what kind of demons might we be able to exercise? What kind of callings might we be able to discern? What kind of community might we find? I dare say we might find a community where people are full. I dare say we might help develop a community where inner beauty is recognized. I dare say we might create a community where encouraged gifts turned outlandish dreams into realized callings. I dare say, friends, we might help to create and belong to a community where sisters, brothers, kindred, all have the authority to be as God created them. I think that's a really good demonstration of authority. Friends, may it be so, and may it be soon. Amen.